Well, good afternoon. My name is Adiba Kamarul Zaman. I'm from University of Malaya in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, and current president of the International AIDS Society. Thank you for inviting me to speak at this forum and bring you highlights and updates on the clinical management of HIV from the IAS 2021 conference last July. That is relevant to our clinical practice in the Asia and the Pacific. Before I do that, allow me to update the epidemiology of HIV and AIDS in our region as it pertains to our clinical practice. Overall, although there has been a decline in the number of new HIV infections and deaths globally, the decline in the Asia and the Pacific, unfortunately, has not reached the target set for 2020. Similarly, the HIV cascade and treatment targets have also not been met. The first 90, for instance, falls short at 76%. And linkage to antiretroviral therapy is even lower at 64%, and likewise, the um, viral load suppression. In a region where the majority of new HIV infections are among key populations, HIV testing, which is obviously the entry point for treatment and prevention, also falls short of targets, as you can see in this slide here most of the key populations, HIV testing is averaging around only 50%. Current treatment scale-up has also um, lagged behind in the Asia-Pacific, lagged behind the global trends. And commensurate with the um, reduction or, or the low levels of HIV testing, it is not surprising that late diagnosis in Asia and the Pacific is more the norm, where um, in many countries, um, late diagnosis represents um, the uh, bulk of patients presenting into HIV care. Now, given this regional landscape, I thought I'd highlight some of the sessions and presentations from IAS 2021 that's relevant to us clinicians and program leaders to address the gaps in HIV services in our countries. Firstly, HIV self-testing. HIV self-testing has shifted the paradigm for HIV testing, the first step in the care continuum, as we just discussed. In this slide here, it summarizes presentations from uh, at, at the IS 2021 from the unit UNITAID-funded HIV self-testing mm -hmm. Africa project known as STAR and the ATLAS project implemented in West Africa, which have demonstrated a critical role for self-testing in reaching populations poorly served by traditional testing modalities, including men, adolescents, and key populations. This was especially relevant uh, during COVID-19 where HIV testing and treatment services have been affected globally which led to substantial declines in HIV diagnoses and antiretroviral therapy initiations. And in these uh, uh, sessions, HIV self-testing was highlighted as a critical tool that could address growing gaps, uh, such as what we're seeing here in Asia. STAR and ATLAS programs have identified new entry points for HIV self-testing to increase access to self-care and showed how self-testing has been leveraged to maintain HIV testing services in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, and also how digital and mHealth solutions were designed to increase HIV self-testing access, support effective use, and facilitate follow-up and linkage to care and prevention services. In another presentation, um, as uh, shown here by Anna Dewal, the, um, a, system, a systematic review of the global evidence of digital HIV self-testing was presented. Um, this study reviewed 39 uh, previous studies, uh, which included randomized control trials, as well as observational studies. And what they found was that uh, in the context of the current COVID-19 pandemic, Digital HIV test self-testing um, is a convenient strategy for hard-to-reach and at-risk populations. The overall evidence suggests that digital HIV self-testing 
will, is well poised to become the new paradigm for HIV self-testing. Following testing, obviously, the second step to the HIV cascade is um, initiation of antiretroviral therapy. Rapid initiation of retro antiretroviral therapy has been a recommendation of the World Health Organization since its previous guidelines in 2017. In this session presented by WHO at the IAS 2021, um, currently WHO recommends same-day antiretroviral uh, testing, and this is based on um, several systematic reviews, based on a systematic review that included three randomized controlled trials and four observational studies, which found that same-day antiretroviral testing is increased with antiretroviral therapy initiation, obviously, increased retention in care, and importantly, increased in viral suppression. The offer of same-day antiretroviral uh, initiation, however, should include approaches to that can improve uptake, treatment adherence, and retention, such as tailored patient education, counseling, and support. Evidence review in 26 studies supported uptake of same-day antiretroviral testings, and um, this should be accompanied by strategies that um, target clients, healthcare providers, as well as the health system to improve delivery services. Based on the evidence, these approaches were associated with increased uptake of antiretroviral therapy, suppression of viral load at 12 months, and retention in care at 12 months, as previously mentioned. This session by WHO also recommended that um, people established on antiretroviral therapy should be offered clinical visits every three to six months, preferably every six months if feasible. And um, this was also accompanied by recommendation that antiretroviral therapy should be offered refills, patients should be offered refills of antiretroviral therapy that can last three to six months, preferably six months if feasible. Multi-month um, antiretroviral uh, treatment or, or um, fills have now, I think, become established, particularly during the COVID-19 pandemic, where uh, frequent visits to clinics uh, became impossible. The next uh, service delivery uh, points that I want to uh, discuss is that of differentiated service delivery. Through the years, it's become obvious that a one-size-fits-all model of HIV services do not work for all 37 million people living with HIV today, and therefore, differentiated service delivery, which is responsive and client-centered, that simplifies and adapts HIV services across the cascade, is better to, better to serve individual needs and reduce unnecessary burdens on the health system. More countries are now revising the HIV service delivery models and recognize that it's time to deliver differently. This is more so in um, Sub-Saharan Africa and uh, not, and in, in, in my view, not very widely practiced in Asia and the Pacific. The DSD for HIV treatment is being scaled up right across Sub-Saharan Africa, but little is actually known about which models work um, best for different groups. Here, I share with you a study that looked at the factors associated with 12-month retention after referral to a different differentiated service delivery for HIV treatment model in Zambia. The study assessed the associations between patient and facility characteristics and 12-month retention across the DSD models in Zambia. Patients were... Um, there was a large cohort nine, uh, involving 90,829 patients. The majority received four to six month um, multi month dispensing. A smaller group received three month uh, dispensing, and 2,789 patients received less than, 12, less than two month dispensing. What the study found was that amongst those receiving the four to six month uh, multi month dispensing, 
and who were put into the fast track um, and group models had lower adjusted risk of loss to follow up after 12 months compared to those receiving only multi-month dispensing. The conclusion of this study is that um, it is important to have um, different um, service delivery that suits um, different settings in, um, uh, in, in our population. Now, moving on to um, comorbidities, as uh, mentioned earlier, in Asia and the Pacific, late pre presentation is very common and therefore patients tend to present with associated opportunistic infections, including cryptococcal meningitis and TB. I'd now like to highlight some of several presentations addressing opportunistic infections. And uh, this first study was that addressing cryptococcal meningitis. This study recruited 814 patients with HIV-associated cryptococcal meningitis it was conducted at eight hospitals across Africa to compare two approaches to induction therapy in adults with HIV in the largest cryptococcal meningitis study conducted to date. The trial arm consisted of a single dose, 10 milligrams per kilogram of liposomal amphotericin B given with 14 days of fluconazole at uh, 1,200 milligrams per day and flucytosine at 100 milligrams per kilograms per day. The control arm consisted of seven days of MFOB, one milligrams per, kilo, per kilogram per day given alongside seven days of flucytosine followed by seven days of fluconazole at 1,200 milligrams per day. The primary outcome was all-cause mortality at 10 weeks, and after the induction phase, all participants received fluconazole, 800 milligrams per day for eight weeks, then 200 milligrams per day thereafter as per the standard of care. As mentioned, in total, 814 patients were enrolled and randomized to one of the two arms, which were well-matched. In the intention to treat analysis, mortality in the ambisome arm was 24.8% compared to a mortality risk of 28.7% uh, in the control arm, yielding a risk difference of 3.93%, well within the pre-specified 10% non-inferiority margin. Results were similar by per-protocol analysis and after adjustment for CSF, fungal count, age, sex, and use of antiretrovirals. In terms of secondary outcomes, the mortality at 2, 4, and 16 weeks in this study showed that ambisome was non-inferior with similar early fungicidal activity. From, in this study, um, ambisome showed clear safety benefits with fewer grade 3 or 4 adverse events within 21 days of randomization, less grade 3 and 4 anemia, and lower requirement for blood transfusion. The average baseline to create to day seven creatinine rise was 20% in the ambisome versus 50% in the control arm. In conclusion, the ambisome uh, arm offers a practical, easier to administer and better tolerated treatment for HIV associated cryptococcal meningitis in Africa with the potential to reduce the length of hospital admissions. However, the cost of ambisome remains a major limiting factor, not just in Africa, but also in Asia. Moving to presentations on tuberculosis, uh, there were several, but I am going to review um, the TB HIV overview session, which summarized the state of current TB HIV epidemic. These are slides presented by Melvin Spiegelman from TB Alliance from the United States, who presented an overview of new drugs and regimens for both drug-sensitive and drug-resistant TB. Novel regimens frequently rely on the newest approved TB drugs, namely Bedequilin, Delamanid, and Bretonamid, which are incorporated in most ongoing trials. New TB approaches in late stages of clinical research include further shortening of the duration of TB treatment. Study 31 showed that a four-month rifepentin and moxifloxacin-based treatment of drug-sensitive TB 
was non-inferior to a six-month standard of care duration, and this was recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine. The other study is the NICS-TB, which assessed the three oral drug vedaquilin, protominate, and barnizolate, otherwise known as BPAL regimen, against highly drug-resistant TB regimen administered for six months. The NICS-TB trial achieved a cure rate of approximately 90% in the BPAL arm compared to a 30% efficacy in the traditional strategy. At IS 2021, we saw the initial results from the ongoing Xenix trial, testing the efficacy of low doses of shorter durations of linezolid to, to reduce side effects. Time to culture negative status was preserved in all, this is in the Xenix trial, but the lower dose, shortest duration line isolate arm and less line isolate exposure was associated with fewer cases of peripheral neuropathy and optic neuritis. With the current pipeline of TB drugs, a universal regimen that would be curative in less than three months, we believe could be well within um, striking distance. Moving on to uh, living with HIV, people living with HIV are now living longer and healthier lives. And with this comes the interplay between HIV comorbidities and age-related illnesses. A symposium session entitled Growing Old with HIV Comorbidities and Aging looked at the interactions between immunosenescence and HIV and whether comorbidities are associated with a host or HIV in this presentation by Lean Riom from CHIP in Denmark, um, entitled Comorbidities in People Living with HIV, Host or HIV Associated. Here, as you can see, people living with HIV have, um, more, uh, have more associated comorbidities, especially as um, they age compared to those people who are not living with HIV. And in the uh, graph on the right of the screen, as you can also see, uh, persons living with HIV um, have multiple uh, diseases, including hypertension, angina pectoris, uh, myocardial ischemic heart disease, chronic liver disease, chronic lung disease, uh, it, 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 more so than those who are HIV negative. So why do people living with HIV have more comorbidities? There are multiple mechanisms and multiple factors that lead to this, including host or lifestyle-related factors, HIV-related factors, including low CD4 count, chronic inflammation, and um, long-term exposure to antiretroviral treatment can lead to these multiple comorbidities that were described before. It is obvious that given these multiple comorbidities that people living with HIV suffer from, a person-centered approach to clinical care is needed to improve management of multimorbidities and improve quality of life. In a consensus statement that I participated in that was published um, around the time of the IS 2021 conference, we made a call for a um, for the global HIV community to consider HIV management beyond viral suppression, taking into account um, the uh, experiences of people living with HIV with multiple morbidity, their quality of life, and the stigma, the ongoing stigma and discrimination that many continue to suffer from and continue to be major major issues for people with living with HIV. We recommended some health systems um, attention to advance the long-term well-being of people living with HIV, including integration of healthcare, incorporating monitoring of comorbidities in electronic health records where possible, developing um, pilot models of care that employ frameworks that look into quality of life beyond just viral suppression. And obviously, um, attending to uh, issues such as um, workplace and healthcare associated stigma and discrimination is key to improving our overall management of people living with HIV.
in our settings. Now, in this last half of my presentation, I will discuss some of the updates in the newer antiretroviral agents as well as regimen. Many of the presentations at IS 2021 focused on dual drug dual therapy versus continued three drug regimen as well uh, for maintenance as well as um, initiation with dual drug therapy in naive patients. I will touch briefly on the Tango study, which um, was presented with week 96 data at IS 2021. The Tango study demonstrated non-inferiority of switching to dolatagravir 3TC combination versus continued uh, TAF-based three-drug therapy. Almost three quarters of Tango participants were on boosted antiretroviral therapy at baseline limits. The trials generalized ability and our inability to interpret metabolic endpoints. However, the eagerly awaited SALSA, a randomized open-label trial, was which was designed to provide more clinically relevant data in a population on a wider range of initial regimens. Participants needed at least two confirmed viral loads below 50 HIV copies while taking two nucleotides reverse transcriptase inhibitors plus a non-nucleoside boosters protease or an integrase inhibitor for at least three months. People with prior vi virological failure, NRTI or integrase inhibitor resistance were excluded. 493 people were randomized on a one-to-one -to, -one to maintain their current regimen or switch to dolatagravir 3TC, the two, and the two arms were very well matched. Baseline antiretroviral therapy was non-nucleoside 50%, integrase 40%, or a protease inhibitor 10%. After 48 weeks, those on uh, dolatagravir 3TC combination um, showed, proved non-inferior to maintaining the initial regimen in terms of the primary endpoint, which was proportioned with a viral load above 50 copies. That's less than 1%. Proportions maintaining viral suppression were similar. None had a confirmed virologically related withdrawal through 48 weeks and no resistance mutations were observed. Drug-related adverse events were broadly similar with slightly more discontinuation in the DTG3TC arm. And there were no serious drug-related adverse events and adjusted average, average weight change from baseline to week 48 measured 2.1 kilograms in the DTG3TC group and 0 0.6 in the control group. Meanwhile, um, much... Uh, excitement centers around the uh, long-acting injectables and data continue to accumulate for uh, this new formulation of antiretroviral therapy for both prevention and treatment. Here, I would like to discuss the Calibrate study utilizing lenacapavir, which is a long-acting capsid inhibitor that only requires six months monthly dosing. Calibrate is a phase two study which randomized 182 treatment naive patients to one of three lenacapavir arms um, with FTC TAF, two using injections with simplification to two drug antiretroviral therapy at week 28, one using oral lenacapavir plus TDF or TAF throughout the study, or to a control arm of Pictagravir FTC TAF. The baseline characteristics included media, um, included um, women um, that made up seven percent of the uh, start trial participants and fifty two percent black individuals. The median age was twenty nine years. The median viral load was four point three log copy log. Um, copies per mil, and the CD4 count was 40, 437 cells per millimeter cube. The primary endpoint was assessed at week 54, and at IS 2021, we saw an interim 
week um, 28 analysis, um, the week four viral load decline was similar in all arms and the week 16 viral load was less than 50 copies in 94% versus 100% in the pool lenacapavir versus the control groups respectively. Adverse events were similar across groups with no drug-related discontinuations or grade four side effects. Injection site reactions were common, but mostly grade one, and some participants reported palpable skin nodules and two participants discontinued due to grade one injection site um, reactions. These results were considered supportive for continuing this dual therapy maintenance therapy switches with extended follow-up to week 80. The next study that I will discuss uh, of a long-acting injectable agent, um, and this one is also involving lenacapavir, is that of the Capella study, which is a study in highly treatment experienced participants with multi-drug resistance HIV. The results that were presented at IS 2021 included the uh, 36 participants who were randomized to receive lenacapavir or placebo for 14 days prior to the addition of the optimized background therapy. Participants had been living with HIV for an estimated median of 24 years with a range of 9 to 44 years. And the proportion with extensive drug resistance to at least two drugs in class was 99% to NRTIs, 97% to NNRTIs, and 81% to PIs, 69% to um, integrase inhibitors at baseline. At week 26, 81% or 29 pages. 29 participants reached a viral load of less than 50 copies and 89% or 32 out of 36 patients reached a viral load um, level of less than 200 copies. The mean CD4 T-cell count rise was 81 cells and included increases to more than 50 cells in the eight participants with a baseline, of CD, baseline CD4 of less than 50. Four of the 11 um, people eligible for resistance testing developed emergent than a cap of their mutations. However, um, their phenotypic impact was actually not discussed in the study. Although no new resistant mutations were reported for other ART regimens, the relatively short follow-up currently limits our interpretation. The study overall found that the toler tolerability was good and there was no study discontinuation and no serious drug-related side effects. Injection site reactions were, however, common but uh, at 56%, but mainly grade 1 and were transient. And finally, um, in terms of uh, the implementation and rollout of long-acting um, injectables. There were three studies, uh, there were three presentations all related to this um, implementation effectiveness study known as customized from the United States of long acting cabotegravir and repilverin injection in US healthcare settings. Customized is a description of implementation of these in injectable agents and how health systems can adapt to this shift in service delivery. Uh, what the studies found was, whilst broadly there was acceptability and preference for injectable over oral treatment, and small barriers could be easily overcome, uh, even during COVID-19 uh, pandemic, this, however, may not be um, generalizable to healthcare systems outside the United States. So we need to... Um, uh, have more implementation research studies involving long-acting injectables to understand the cost implications and other health system changes that's needed um, in um, healthcare settings in Asia, the Pacific, and other regions of the world. These were some of the healthcare professionals and patient implement implementation barriers that were studied um, in this customized study. 74% of patients reported 
no interference or, or difficulties with monthly injection sites, uh, monthly injection visits, and um, perceived barriers to monthly injectable um, uh, of, of um, long-acting cabotegravir um, and repilverine were um, able to be overcome in most instances. There was very high acceptability in terms, uh, as, as seen here, 93% of patients thought the time spent in clinic for the injections was extremely or very acceptable. Um, and there was very few discontinuation um, as a result of uh, this mode of delivery. And biologic success was achieved in um, a large number of patients. So in conclusion, um, healthcare staff across different clinic types in the United States found implementation of the long-acting injectables both feasible and acceptable despite disruptions due to COVID-19. 78% of healthcare staff indicated that optimal um, implementation could be achieved as quickly as uh, within one to three months. And uh, some perceived barriers were able to be decreased within 12 months of implementation. As mentioned, um, these findings may not be generalizable to all healthcare settings and further implementation research should be conducted in different settings, particularly in Asia and the Pacific, where um, the rollout of long-acting injectables have not happened. So in conclusion, IS uh, 2021 had a very exciting program with a broad range of um, studies um, um, presented in both um, the symposium sessions as well as the oral abstract sessions discussing a multitude of topics, including um, scaling up of HIV self-testing, which um, would be very relevant to the Asia Pacific region, given our relatively, um, uh, well, well, given that we have not achieved in most countries, the 90% targeted um, first um, 90 uh, goal, uh, Same-day antiretroviral initiation should also be rolled out and uh, several studies um, and the WHO symposium presented systematic reviews of um, antiretroviral, same-day antiretroviral initiation, which shows uh, in increased uptake, increased adherence, as well as um, very um, good outcomes in terms of viral suppression. All healthcare systems need to look at uh, rolling out of antiretroviral therapy in a patient-centered manner through differentiated service delivery that's flexible and responsive to patient needs. The IS uh, 2021 also presented data on um, the success of ambisome treatment for cryptococcal meningitis, as well as exciting advances in TB management, particularly in shorter courses of anti-TB anti treatment for um, fully drug-sensitive TB and um, development of many new drugs um, uh, for the treatment of both um, drug-resistant as well as drug-sensitive TB that opens up um, much more um, uh, positive uh, outlook in terms of the overall management of TB, in, including uh, TB and HIV co-infection. As mentioned, as patients living with HIV continue to live longer, um, one consideration that all clinicians uh, need to look into is the presence of multimorbidities in our patients. And once again, uh, a patient-centered approach, including um, delivery of integrated care that, um, looks at the multi-morbidities that our patients suffer from, as well as the ongoing concerns of healthcare-associated stigma and discrimination, and the quality of life in patients beyond just viral suppression uh, must begin to be addressed in, in all our clinic settings. And finally, I also presented 
um, new data on both uh, two drug regimens for naive and experienced patients, as well as new data looking at long-acting injectables in um, the treatment armamentarium for our patients living with HIV. Moving forward, there, there is reason for um, there is very much reason for optimism in terms of delivering um, better HIV care for all our patients in Asia and the Pacific. We must do more to um, close the gap that um, we here in Asia and the Pacific um, see in the HIV treatment cascade, as well as in the prevention of HIV in those at risk in Asia and the Pacific. Thank you very much for your attention and good afternoon.